Hey, hey, hello. Hello. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Just checking everyone's paying attention. Um, so yeah, here we go. Let's do it. Let's do the talk. So just little hello. Uh, I don't know how many people remember. I was here last year. So if you remember me, like hello. If you don't, nice to meet you. Um, maybe you can see your hello, everyone greeting there. I don't know the languages of everyone here. I tried to pick a nice variety. Um, that last one, that is the Australian English way to greet plural people. In American English, the you can be singular or plural, so it's confusing. But we invented this yas, how you's going. So that's how you address a group of people in Australian English. Um, so the next thing we have to tick off the list is the quote for the conference. Like every good talk needs a quote to like feign that you're cultured. This is mine, hello, hello, good to be back, which is attributed to the 20th century poet, Hans Peter Baxter. Don't know if anyone knows who that is. Uh, we've got, there he is, the man himself, and a few translations of that quote. Uh, need to do a little bit of a spiel about the organization I work for, Catalyst IT. Uh, this is a fun slide because I can point to where I come from, which is So it's a long way. Um, last time I struggled through hurricanes and stuff. There were no hurricanes this time. So I had a very relaxed trip here and I'm happy to be calmly presenting today. Um, there's a few pics of Catalyst staff. You may have even met some. And there's, you know, Sam there from the Catalyst booth. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I was here before and you might remember me as like the double hurricane guy or something like that. This is the same slide from before, so just go through it quickly. Uh, yeah, that's my favorite shell. That's my development, uh, sorry, my desktop environment. That's my terminal emulator. That's my text editor. The percentage of largest sites in a hemisphere upgraded is 50. Outstanding statistic there. Favorite integer is 1729. Last time I said I checked them all and I found that was the best one. I checked them again and it's still the best one. <laughs> Pale ales, arms, me, Cam, double hurricane ball. <laughs> um, okay, what's next? So, yeah, this is about the talk. Uh, the technicality level is, is moderate. I'm sorry if you're a dev and you came expecting to learn like wicked dev spells or something like that. It's, it's not really like that. Is a case study? Yes. Is as glamorous as the title makes it sound? Probably not. The uh, allure wears off as soon as you realize most of the world is not in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> um, so I just want to set some expectations for the talk because last time I talked about queuing algorithms and that's pretty much as exciting as it gets. So I've got a graph that I want to share of the, how you can expect this talk to go. So birth of your first child, you know, a nice 50 excitement level. Queuing algorithms obviously is 100. This talk, you, you know, somewhere about 75, okay? So I just don't want anyone to expect too much. Um, but I'm gonna do my best to make it fun because I don't like boring conference slides. Um, I have a slide about boring conference slides and a picture of a boring conference slide. Um, and my notes say, ha ha ha, say something funny about programmers and recursion. So I, di I didn't figure out the joke yet, but yep, yeah, boring slide. We don't want that. Um, so this next part, there is a bit of flashy colors and possibly a bit of loudness. So. Do you know which knob to turn in case it's too loud? I prepared a little video to sort of make it more fun. Um, we've got the party later, which is 80s themed, and I like video games from the 80s. So if you'll allow me, I made a little introduction video that's 80s <laughs> video game themed about the talk. So hopefully it works.
<laughs> hey, so I want to point out everything used to make that video was open source software. So when Catalyst say expert open source solutions, we, we mean it. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, I'm in the northern hemisphere, come to the southern hemisphere, everything's upside down for me. Um, and that, my friend told me that was how to translate the title of the talk into Spanish. Um, so I hope it was accurate. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's start talking about actual stuff. Uh, prologue. So now we've got video game font. All right. Just want to give a bit of background about how I ended up doing this stuff. Uh, how it all began was actually this time last year at this conference, um, I have a little bit of a summary. I was having a chat with my colleague and he asked me, did you ever upgrade Moodle before? And um, I said, yes, over 100,000 times because I was at the uh, Moodle Cloud talk it was mentioned that, you know, COVID was crazy. I was the guy that upgraded the Moodle Cloud sites during COVID. So it's like, yeah, I'm all smug. Like, no worries, I got this. And it's like, hey, do you want to upgrade this Moodle? <laughs> and sort of a bit reacted like that. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll give it a try. <laughs> Dramatic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had to put that emoji in there, and I liked it so much that I had to... It just looks funny. Um, so I wanted to have a cool slide with little bits and pieces, like statistics, about this site. But uh, my colleague Joey already did a really good talk called Maintaining Mission Critical Middle Systems at Scale. And he had a cool slide with stats. So if you saw that, just imagine that slide here. But I wanted to put the interesting, like one number about this site. And that number is 5.44 terabytes. And what that is, is the size of the database of this site. So it's pretty, it's, <laughs> this is big. <laughs> um, so but that number's hard to grok, like hard to comprehend. So I wanted to put it in a bit more, you know, meaningful measures. So this is the Nintendo Entertainment System, which has 2,048 bytes of memory. So if we express the database in terms of Nintendos, it is <laughs> 2 billion 656 million 250,000 Nintendos. <laughs> so that probably is easier to understand, right? I, I calculated it. If you stack that many Nintendos, you get like roughly halfway to Mars. So that, there you go. Now you can visualize how big it is. It's big. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about the sort of way we decided to tackle the problem. There's two main ways you can do it, okay? One is to run the upgrade script on the largest Moodle in the Southern Hemisphere. The other is to delete the largest Moodle in the Southern Hemisphere and start again from scratch. And there was actually a secret third approach from the Catalyst AI research labs. Um, and I have some, some leaked footage of that that I'd like to share now as well. Um, this has some loud noises. So if, if that affects you, just you know, be aware. Hopefully it's not going to be too loud. Oh, sorry, should tell you what it is. This thing is get AI to do it. So <laughs> that's the approach, and here's the video of trying to get the AI to do it. Okay, so that's the last funny video for a little while. <laughs> it gets more serious now. But yeah, even large language models are aware of the competence and sheer brilliance of Catalyst IT. That really was ChatGPT, by the way. Uh, if you can figure out how I did that, I'd like to hear your thoughts about, about what I did to make that happen. Um, okay, so yeah, time to be serious. Um, a little bit about this site. We are actually the third vendor to look after it and coincidentally the only one that they've decided to keep looking after it. Um, 
Uh, unfortunately, that presents a whole host of challenges that I've summarized in a little simulated dialogue here. So these are technical considerations. Oh, sorry, let me just go through this. Uh, lots and lots of content, lots and lots of DB craft, lots and lots of code. We don't know what it does. And that sounds bad, but it's big. Moodle's big, right? Like, it's not like we don't know what we're doing. It's like there's lots of it, and it's weird. Um, so, oh, yeah, I have this. Uh, so, uh, what is it? Yeah, it's a visual analogy of the state of the largest Moodle in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, this is the simulated conversation. Sorry, I got my slides mixed up there. So here we go. They come just like, oh no, Catalyst, it's a, it's a bug. What can you do? And, you know, so, oh yeah, we'll provide you support, solutions, and solve all the problems. In other words, we're going to solve it. Yeah. And later, but not too much later, because we're, we're on to stuff, we're quick. Yeah, wow, Catalyst, you solved it in timely and a professional fashion. Everything's good. So yeah, no problem. Just had some invalid DB state. And it's a piece of cake when you're Catalyst IT. <laughs> but... How, how did it happen? How did the DB get that way? And the usual response to that is a much more professional one than this, which is a... Uh, oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> that's unfortunately, that's the reality, right? Like sometimes the database is just weird and we fix it, but we don't know how it got weird or if it's going to get weird again. Um, so that's obviously not ideal. The conclusion that we came up with is that the existing system presents too many challenges and risks. Tech debt has become unmanageable. And I have an updated visual and analogy, which is, <laughs> <laughs> this uh, and the caption revised. There we go. So that's sort of where we got to, um, which led us to the decision that we will go Greenfield. So that's the delete everything and start again. Um, that just seemed like the best way forward. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, we decided to go with 4.1, which is, of course, the LTS. The previous version of Moodle they were on was 3.9. Also LTS. Um, so um, I would like to take a brief moment to discuss the philosophy of the project. So here's a nice word, amortization, which is not normally applied to software, but I like to. That's the usual definition of that word. Um, but I think about it more like in this context, where it's like you want to write a script to do something, but actually writing the script ends up taking longer than it would have taken to just do the task. Um, and so as, as a developer, like I like to write code, hey? But I had to keep this image in my brain while working on this project to make sure I didn't sort of go down the, the rabbit hole of, of coding. So put some restrictions on ourselves, which is only write scripts when it makes sense. And you ask what's makes sense. Like how long would it take to do it by hand? How error prone is the task? How hard are the errors to fix? How simple would a script be? constraints. If I start, you know, thinking like, oh yeah, script time, automation, and it doesn't work in two hours, then I just, no, don't do it. Just find some other way. Um, and uh, here's the slide where I talk about <laughs> how we thought it was going to go. So this is another nice word. I'm sure people know this one. It's like, yeah, lack of experience, wisdom, or judgment, which sounds like a bad thing, but <laughs> there aren't many biggest Moodles in the Southern Hemisphere to practice on. Um, so I think you can forgive us, but now, now, Catalyst IT has all the knowledge about upgrading the largest Moodle site in the Southern Hemisphere. So get in touch about upgrading big Moodles. Um, so our expectation was something like this. Delete Moodle. So something. Yeah, yeah, that's what we thought was going to happen. But the reality, you know, the summary of the simple three-step plan, what actually happened was something more like this. And what's about to show up is the actual checklist of things we did, like the last final checklist of steps to take to get the site configured. And it's a lot more than three steps, right? <laughs> yeah. There was over 100 like individual steps that we had to follow in the end. <laughs> yeah, that guy. 
So uh, this, is, <laughs> this is where I start talking about what we actually did instead of silly videos and, and dumb stuff like that. So phase one was the core customization analysis. So as you can imagine, like I said, there were plenty of like hacks and stuff that were, were in Moodle Core. So we had to do an audit of all of them to figure out what was needed, what wasn't, what the code did. Um, so the requirement, as I said, for each customization, work out what it is, decide if we need it, the strategy, uh, identify every piece of code, which is not part of vanilla Moodle 3.9. And we're very lucky that there's a tool for it called Git. So a bit of an obscure one. I don't know if you've used that before. Um, so that's the, the magic spell that we used to, to get the differences. Um, I can't show the output of that, but if I tweak it a little bit, I can show you that. So there were 1,042 customizations that we had to audit. <laughs> so last time he shows up, I think. Um, so tooling for that operation was a spreadsheet, um, which my colleagues were talking about before. Spreadsheets are invaluable when doing this kind of thing. Keyboard shortcuts to focus windows. It sounds a bit silly, but it was extremely useful to be able to just like quickly toggle between windows and check things. Um, and a small shell script. Uh, and copy paste. And eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, yeah, so here is a sort of what the spreadsheet kind of looked like. This is the <laughs> Catalyst Collaborative Document Suite. Um, that's largest Moodle in the Southern Hemisphere on Moodle 3.9. That's the commit hash that's not present in vanilla Moodle 3.9. That's a, a me commit message associated with that. Um, these are the things we had to start filling in. So, like, is, is that commit in Moodle 4.1? Uh, if it's an MDL, what's the status of it? Like, for example, we backport things frequently, and sometimes the MDLs just don't get closed. So that's useful to know. And then finally, obviously, like, is it needed or not? So the goal is obviously to come up with a big list of commits that we need to put into the new 4.1 code base. Um, so the workflow was select a spreadsheet cell, control C the commit hash, use my keyboard shortcut to switch to the terminal, uh, you run the shell script, control shift V is how I pasted what was on the clipboard, and use, use the eyeballs, go back to the spreadsheet, and you know, fill out the fields. Check, oops, sorry, check the MDL status if necessary. Uh, so I'm gonna, oh, here's an example of the output of that script. So it, what, the way it works is you show the commit in the largest Moodle in the Southern Hemisphere, then it uses the commit message to see if the corresponding uh, commit exists in Moodle 4.1, because of course the commit hash will be different. Um, and it uses the numstat thing, which is useful because you can see if it's identical. And in this case, you can see it's not. So the, that server.php, the, the real version of that has five changes. So something is different about what's in the 3.9 code base versus what made it into the 4.1 code base. So normally it was okay. No one's just like, oh yeah, maybe they amended a comment or something like that. But that's the kind of thing we were looking for to see like, oh, maybe we need to go and investigate. Like there could be some subtle difference here that could be a problem. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to do a quick demo of that for you. So. This is not the real spreadsheet, but close to it. Oh, this is quite, so if I go there, and I can bring my terminal over, and I would, that's me using the shortcut. Oh, wow. Uh, and then I can go check back port, paste the commit hash. And in this case, it didn't find anything in Moodle 4.1. And I know that's because that MDL is still open. Um, so in this case, uh, we go back to the spreadsheet. Um, whatever commit message doesn't matter. The commit in 4.1 is NA. The status is open. I checked that ahead of time. Uh, so that means we need it. Yay. And then we can go to this one and do the same thing again. And this time, again, it happened that it's not in 4.1, but in this case, it was interesting. It's because the commit message is different in 4.1. Uh, it doesn't have the full stop in 4.1 for some reason. Um, and then the last one is 
that one is in 4.1. Uh, you can see you've got the status there and it's identical. So, wow, well, well, at least in terms of the amount of stuff changed. So we can jump back to the spreadsheet and you'll notice it automatically copied the commit hash in 4.1 to the clipboard. So I can just paste it in there. And so we just did that thousands of times to end up, oh, sorry, I should set that to, to no. There we go. Did that thousands of times, filtered the list so that we only had the ones with Y in that column. And, and that was that. That's what we did. Um, so let me try to get back to the presentation. And it, it worked great. It was, it was good. A bit tedious, but having the shortcuts made it um, go a lot faster. OK. Um, I just want to make a comment here. The tiny MCE guys have this poster saying that they have 99.9% .9 accurate copy paste. But with this uh, bash script technology, Catalyst IT has 100% accurate copy and paste. So uh, <laughs> they said it couldn't be done. <laughs> uh, sorry, tiny MC guys. I, I know there's more to it than that. Um, okay, yeah. So when all that was said and done, uh, we had a, a big list of commits. And we found some, some stuff that was fun. We found craft strings. Um, if you're looking for some simple stuff to work on in Moodle core, you could work on removing these language strings because they're just still there and they're not used anywhere. And you can see from the numbers, the MDL numbers, they've been around for some time. Um, and generally, not much else. It went really smoothly. Um, and Moodle, uh, yeah, kudos to Moodle in this case because the policy of maintaining backwards compatibility really worked to our advantage here. Um, experience, it's a 7.49 out of 10. I'd like to be accurate. And I would do it, I would do it that way again. Like, it, it was fine. You have to audit the code base. And now we had a good understanding of what the code base is like. So that was great. Uh, phase two is plugins analysis. So of course, they have their own plugins. Some work on 4.1, some don't. Um, so the requirement is a way to manually audit every plugin in the code base for each plugin, work out what it is, uh, decide if it's needed. And the strategy was get a bunch of humans to do it. So we just, you know, made a spreadsheet and got four developers on it and, you know, just whatever. We worked with the spreadsheet, uh, tooling, a spreadsheet, Zoom calls with the client uh, because we needed to know if they actually needed that plugin anymore. Collaboration. There's what the spreadsheet roughly looked like. I'm not going to do the same thing like I did before. You know, it's like the path of the plugin on disk, the type, the, you know, what branch it's on, all that kind of stuff. So. Um, we did have to have some tough conversations with the client, which is like, hey, we identified this plugin, can we leave it out? And the answer was always, yeah, you, yeah, you can. And we'll come back to that later. Um, so contributions, this was cool. In doing this, we um, were able to fix some stuff in various plugins out and about. Um, Qtype stack was the main one that caused us grief. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that plugin. It's a question type plugin where you can specify mathematical equations and stuff like that. It's very cool. Um, we fixed their GitHub actions because we needed that to work for our continuous uh, integration, continuous deployment pipelines. So they were grateful for that. And this is, I did not expect to be doing this. We wrote a patch to allow unit tests to pass using different maximas. Maxima is a thing written in the Lisp programming language that actually does the computer algebra stuff um, so that it works compiled against any Lisp. So there's different flavors of Lisp, whatever you want to call it. And as an Emacs user, it was a joy to get paid to play with Lisp. Um, and we also improved this project called Maxima Pool Docker. It's an abandoned project, but we have our, our own fork of it and we still use it. It um, makes a, a process pool of these Maxima things and it speeds things up a lot. And if you are interested, you can, that's a link. So when these are online, you'll be able to click it. You can check out our Docker file improvements branch. We just made that a whole lot easier to work with different versions of the Qtype stack plugin. So that was nice. Good, good feeling giving back to the community. There is a commit that I made in the Qtype stack plugin, which is the highlight of my professional career. Just look at that commit message. Better normalized floats for cross compatibility between SBCL and GCL Maxima. Like, 
and it gets better. I changed a comment in the project from the base of the natural logarithms to Euler's number. And you can look at the commit if you want. And Euler was thrilled. <laughs> I get little e would be more appropriate maybe, but whatever. And you know, just give credit where credit is due. Functions, super useful. And even 18th century mathematicians know that Catalyst IT is the place to come for all your expertise. OK, experience. Um, 7.71828 subtract E out of 10. That's 5 out of 10. It was OK, but I don't really know how to make it much better. E is Euler's number. Phase 3. Oh, man, one minute left. That's not going to happen. Configuration migration. We had to manually audit every single config value from core and plugins, work out what it is, decide if it's needed, uh, bring across other things like profile fields, roles, web services, grade scales, schedule tasks. Automation was the solution here. Naivete. Again, we had this idea that we would, with our nice new shiny code base, run upgrade.php on it locally, on a smaller database, restore it, and then everything would be great. In reality, it didn't work out that way because of things that are really good about Moodle and have never caused headaches. A lack of referential integrity in the database and backup and restore. So the tooling there was this report custom SQL plugin, which the Open University makes, so shout out to them. PHP scripts and eyeballs. So for basic cases, um, if it's feasible, we simply looked at the UI for the 3.9 site, click, click, copy, copy, paste, paste into the 4.1 site, Grade scales, good example. There's a few grade scales, so that was easy to do. Um, if export import functionality exists, we'd use that. So roles is a good example. And if a core API exists, we use that to make a script. So cohorts is an example of that. Uh, there's some code, like the script is small. We used the um, custom SQL plugin to generate a JSON file of all the cohorts in the DB and just run the script, makes the cohort. Easy peasy. A complex case is comparing the configuration values across different environments. So obviously they've set things and we need to figure out if that's a non-default setting and whether or not it needs to be set that way in the new environments. Um, it's not important, but we wanted to compare these different values, the value in 3.9 UAT staging production, the value here, here, here. Does, does it matter? There's a coffee no, break. No, I'm just saying. Does anyone I'm want just, me to finish? I'm just, I'm just wanting to make it. <laughs> Okay. Coffee breaks on now. You know, I'm going to stay and listen to Cam. If everyone else is happy to stay, I'm just letting everyone know the coffee break. So, Thanks very much. Sorry, sorry. It's, it's too fun. It's too fun. <laughs> um, and the value, so I'm going to slow down now. So the value after upgrading from 3.9 to 4.1. Um, so we use the ad hoc DB queries to export the fields of the relevant tables, MDL config and MDL config plugins. Then we use the magic script. The magic script has these great features. It had the ability to create placeholder values, the ability to create variables. For example, exactly what I mentioned before, when you need to specify IDs that could be different in the new system versus the old system. Um, the ability to just stop and resume, because there's like several thousand configs to configure. So you know, you want to go make a cup of tea or something, just stop it and come back, and it picks up where you left off. Um, the ability to intelligently skip irrelevant configs, that was pretty, pretty useful, like if it's just the default value, for example. You don't need to look at it. It's fine. And a beautiful UI, fully compatible with ANSI escape sequences. And it fit into a very satisfying 250 or so lines of code. Um, so it was pretty easy to write, ticked off all those constraints that set for ourselves in the beginning. And going to try a quick demo of that one. So, um, so you, you run the script, it's a PHP script, and then you tell it the name of the file you want it to make. So it makes a shell script. And I mean, look at that UI. That is outstanding. So this one, it's C, found CFG 15 out of 3760. It wants us to tell it what to do. So it's like, hey, this is, this is different. You need to figure it out. And so I can pick 
any one of those. So uh, for fun, in this case, I'm going to add a variable. It's called hello. And then we go to the next one. And we can see what's happened here. This one has that value in 4.1 UAT and staging. So it's likely that they want that in the production environment. So I'm going to go ahead and pick A. And you know you can keep going. This one they've done. This one's weird. They had something in UAT, then in staging it's different, and then in prod it's back to what it was in UAT. So who knows? Maybe we want to come back to that, investigate a bit more. So that for that one we press R. Okay. So I'm going to close the script here and show you the what it produced. So I produced this plugin CFG thing. It's it's just a big old shell script that you can give to your friendly sysadmin to run. And you can look at it and see what's going on. Um, and if I start this script to generate that again, you'll see up the top it says 113. It goes back down to 40 because we said skip that one and come back to it. So it knows. And maybe I've decided, OK, just going to skip this entirely. And then we jump back up to 113 where we left off. So th this script was awesome. I got so good at just sitting there and being like, duk, 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 getting through all the configs. I really liked using it. So back to the presentation. Interesting case was the role matrices. So these are like what roles can be as, uh, can assign other roles. They had a lot of them, <laughs> and. Maybe there is some cool way to do it. I came up with my own cool way to do it. I'm not sure if it's the best way, but we'll go through. This is what I was doing. So, That was dumb. That was a really dumb way to do it. And I did that like four times um, before having this thought. It's like, oh no, if only there was a way to write code in the browser that ticked boxes. And then I remembered this thing exists. Um, and I had like a, <laughs> I had a really uh, interesting revelation, which was we can just uh, do something like this in JavaScript get the state of all the boxes and then just spew it out as a JSON string. And then on the other side, read that string and apply the state to all the boxes on that side. Um, so I'm going to attempt to show you that real quickly. So if I just go back to here and copy this. Oh, whoops. So this is, this is the 3.9 site, got like this interesting pattern of, of stuff in the matrix and I paste my code here. I get a nice string, a nice JSON string that tells me the state of every box. Then I can copy that over to the 4.1 site. Actually, I should copy the code here first. So I can copy that, go to here where it's different, paste that in. This is quite challenging because I can't easily see what I'm looking at. Then. D 
didn't work. But whatever, it does work. <laughs> That's too, too hard for me to see. You pasted outside the um, quotes, fam. I totally did. No, nah, it's not working. So at least one of the demos had to fail, right? And it's that one. But yeah, totally works. Um, and was a... <laughs> cool solution to that problem. Um, because the cool part was once the checkboxes are all set, you can actually like just visually look at it and s before pressing the save button. So nothing's happening until you press that save button. And you don't need like a sysadmin to run a script or anything like that. I was really pleased with uh, coming up with that weird hacky solution that definitely works. Um, so experience, 8 out of 10. This is probably my favorite part of the whole thing. Um, the config migration script was a joy to write news, and I would definitely do that again. I would not do the click click thing again. That was ridiculous. Um, I hope the boss isn't here, because he might not be happy that I was spending hours of the day clicking checkboxes. <laughs> Phase four, quality assurance. We're getting close to the end now. This is the part where we triage issues and fix the real ones. Strategy, keep fixing things until they're fixed. <laughs> uh, so the tooling was a spreadsheet, surprise, patience, and that's it. Uh, this is the follow-up to the tough conversations. <laughs> It says, oh, no, Catalyst, the plugin we want to remove has stopped functioning. It's like, yeah, because we removed the plugin. <laughs> but we need the functionality from the plugin. <laughs> so it's like, OK, so you want it installed? And yeah. Would you like all the configuration migrated? Yeah. <laughs> Even after we finalized it and we said, you know, and it's difficult to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we did it. The, you know, whatever. It's the biggest moodle in the Southern Hemisphere. You only get to do it once. And they were happy. <laughs> um, so <laughs> enterprise grade patience from Catalyst IT here. Um, so we made some discoveries, bugs. Uh, you can quickly read them. Some backwards compatibility breaking stuff was found during the QA. So most of these are fixed now, I think. So um, this one, d Tim, do you, did you know if that got fixed? This is that one where the DOM nodes would duplicate. This one's bizarre. Yeah. Anyway, have a look at that one. It's fun. You set up filters in a certain way, and questions just start duplicating themselves in, in the DOM. It's wild. Um, uh, some minor issue with selectors in that project. Honorable mention to debugging curl headers and proxies. So this MDL sets this curl opt thing. And this is what it affects. It affects the header size attribute because this, this header size thing includes the suppressed headers. So even though the headers aren't present in the response, the header size attribute like, is as if they are there. So if you've got any code that's splitting headers, which you shouldn't be doing, um, that relies on this header size thing, and you have a proxy, it goes just all busted. Like, it chops the headers in the wrong place. Um, and so I filed this MDO. It's not really a core problem. It's the problem in this Panopto plugin. They shouldn't be doing what they're doing. If you're using that, just something to be aware of. Um, and so that was a really great experience that I can summarize here. So you know, debugging curl requests, pretty good. Debugging curl requests with proxies, even better. <laughs> reading the libcurl documentation is a bliss, obviously. And then reading the source code of libcurl. That's what we had to do to figure out what was going on. Um, and I'm a serious person, and I'm never sarcastic. Catalyst is just overjoyed to go to this level of pure dedication, reading libcurl C libraries to figure out what's going wrong with someone else's product. <laughs> Um, experience, 5 out of 10. You know, it's not the most fun thing in the world, but QA never is, right? So I don't really know how we could improve that. Epilogue, very close now. Um, have another silly video of the state. There, fix forever. So it's fixed forever until it's not, right? 
Uh, what's next? We've got content migration to do because there's some content in the old site. They want the new site. We didn't really delete it. It's still there. Um, we've got to update integrations with like their student management system. Uh, some plugins that we're developing are, are in the works. I don't know if they're going to be public. They might be, but they're going to be cool either way. It's just who gets to appreciate them, me or you. Um, and that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. I'm really sorry that went over, but it doesn't seem like you mind. <laughs>